Let's pray together. God, as we prepare to turn to your word, we give you thanks that you have not only paid the ransom for us in in some long ago place or time, but that you continue to forgive our sins and draw us closer to you by your spirit and by your word. As we turn to your word now, we ask, just as you've promised to do, that you would speak loudly and clearly and that you'd open up our hearts and our minds and our lives to be convicted by our sin. Be reminded that we're forgiven. Be comforted by the sweet words of the gospel. We ask this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We are in a series working our way through uh, 1 Thessalonians, this uh, letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. And just as a quick recap, we believe that he was only there for about three weeks. He talks about spending three Sabbaths with them. And during that time, this church uh, started, it began, they they, uh, heard the gospel and responded to it. And then right after that, this group of people became angry with what Paul was teaching, what he was saying, and they chased him out of town, not only out of Thessalonica, but he went to the next town and they chased him out of that town too, okay? That's how passionately they were opposed to Paul and his message. And so now he's been away from them. Uh, we think for a period of months, maybe even a, a year or so, and now he, he, he's concerned about them, and he's writing back to them to find out how are these people doing, this group of young believers that I established but then was removed from. And so that's what we're going to be uh, looking at this morning. And he gives them two uh, main thoughts in this uh, passage we're going to look at. The first is this, he encourages them. Or in fact, maybe even he thanks God for them, saying, I thank God that you're standing firm. And then his second message to them is, keep standing firm. Okay, I mean, if you didn't get it from the children's message, our theme this morning is encouraging the saints to stand firm. In fact, I'm even wearing my stand firm socks this morning. Uh, I can't stand on one foot, but here they are. There. It's in German. You can't read it anyway. But anyway... Stand firm. Encouraging the saints to stand firm. That's what we're looking at this morning. He starts, we're starting at uh, chapter 2, verse 17, where he writes this. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did. Again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So Paul's writing to this church and he's saying, I have been longing, I've been so desperate to come and see you, he says. Uh, certainly I, he says, I've been longing to come and see you, but he says there's been this, this blockage and it's Satan, that Satan has been preventing him from getting there to see them and encourage them. Uh, here's just one of those places, again, in uh, Western Christianity, it's become more and more common to talk about Satan as kind of a figurative enemy or kind of that it's a metaphor for opposition like Paul wanted to go see them but ah just couldn't make the time right he was too busy and Satan is the the obstruction of uh, the time and the other responsibilities he has or I wanted to see you but ah Satan stopped me how crummy weather I just couldn't get there that's not what Paul's saying For Paul, Satan is always a real being, a a real individual opposed to God. Also, in the life of Jesus, he's not opposed to this uh, metaphorical enemy. Satan is this real being who is opposed to Jesus, opposed to Christianity, opposed to us as Christians, opposed to what God has been doing in the world. And so that's significant just to kind of remind ourselves that there is this enemy against us and who is active in the world. We don't know exactly how Satan is opposing Paul, right? He doesn't give us the explanation here, and there's a number of theories, but the theory that makes the most sense to me, that's the most understandable, is is not that Satan is marching around and attacking Paul on his own, but remember, he stirred up this crowd in Thessalonica to be opposed to him, and I think that that, that fury, that, that rage, that angst against Paul, Satan's continuing to keep that stirred up. So Paul says, I want to come back, but I can't. Why? 
they'll kill me, they'll arrest me. I, if I come back, that's the end. I won't have this opportunity to encourage you the way that I want to. And I can explain more of why I think that makes the most sense in just a minute as we head to the next verses. It says this in verses 19 and 20. What is our hope, our joy, our crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Uh, Paul says, I want to come back and see you and see if you are, are standing firm in the faith. Why? Because that's our everything. That's what matters to us. That's the most significant thing in my life, Paul is saying. In my life, the most significant thing is you. Are you still standing firm in the faith? Because Jesus is coming back. And when Jesus comes back, he's not going to say, okay, uh, let me hear from each of you how much money do you have in the bank? Or how many countries did you visit when you were traveling on vacation? That's not what Jesus will be concerned about. And that's what not, not what we're going to point him to. We're not going to say, Jesus, look how many selfies I took. Or, or look how, how many uh, restaurants I ate at. Or look at how many fast cars I've driven. None of those things will matter when Jesus comes back. Only do you believe in him. Only are you still faithful to him. Only are you still trusting in him as the one and only savior of the world who takes away our sins. Paul calls, calls them uh, my hope, my joy, my crown. He uses these two different words, our, our glory and joy, he says. Indeed, you are our glory and joy the implication of that word for glory is uh, something that you'd kind of brag about, something that you would show off, almost like when a, when a couple gets engaged, right? And what do they want to show you? The ring, right? Oh, we got engaged. Did you see anything different here, right? They want to show you the ring because that tells the story. Or, or it's like when a couple has a brand new baby, right? And they want you to see the baby and they've got the baby here, but they also want to show you the first 3,000 pictures they've taken of the baby, right? It's what their, their glory is all wrapped up in that thing. Paul says, my glory, the thing I want to show off is you. The thing I'm going to brag about is you that you've come to faith, that you're keeping the faith, that you're trusting in Jesus. He says, you're my glory and my joy. That one thing that puts a smile on his face every single day is thinking about those faithful Thessalonians who are trusting in Jesus. Man, you're my glory. I can't wait to present you to Jesus. Man, you're my joy. I just keep thinking about how you came to faith so quickly and how you're trusting in Jesus. Chapter 3 starts with these words. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who was our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. Paul says, I can't stand it anymore. It's like he and, and uh, Silas and Timothy have been sitting around the three of them saying, like, we got to go check on them. We can't go check on them. If we go there, they're going to kill us. But we got to go check on them. I got to know how they're doing. Yeah, but if we go, they're going to kill us. And so Paul and Silas are having this ongoing conversation. And then I kind of picture the three of them sitting there and all eyes falling on Timothy. What if we send him? Why do they want to send Timothy? Do they not care if Timothy dies? Paul's like, I don't want to die, but Timothy, he can go. No. The reason I think that the opposition that Satan is opposing them with is that they've stirred up this crowd against Paul, so they're still on the watch for him, is because Paul says, I can't come, but Timothy can. And why can Timothy go? It's because he wasn't in Thessalonica with them the first time. So nobody knows Timothy. They haven't seen Timothy's face. And so they're, they're sitting there saying, who can we send to check in? Well, let's send Timothy. Timothy's probably saying, I can go. They don't know me. They don't know what I look like. I can go check in on these Christians and, and, and report back to them that, that you're praying for them and worried about them. And then I can bring their response back to 
you. It says uh, there that he sent him to strengthen and encourage, or other translations say to establish and encourage. Those two things are significant, to, to establish someone or strengthen someone and then to encourage them, like to make sure they have a good foundation first and then encourage them in that foundation. Like when you're teaching a child to count, right, as an example, if you say, repeat after me, one, two, three, four, five, and they say, one, three, five, you give them some encouragement, but you don't say, well, that's good enough. We can leave it at one, three, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, three, five, ten. Yay! You nailed it, right? If we only gave encouragement at that point, we'd have a bunch of 50-year-olds who count count, right? What birthday are you having? I don't know. I can't count that high. First, you need to really establish the foundation, right? Strengthen the foundation, and then as you're doing that, you encourage it. But you don't encourage wrong behavior. You don't encourage false beliefs. You don't encourage things that are not in line with the Word of God. You make sure it's rooted and founded on this sure foundation of the gospel, and then you encourage growth in that. Look at verse 4 up there. Is it up there? Can we back up just a little bit? In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. It's fascinating. He's there for three weeks. What does he keep reminding them of? Persecution. How often in Sundays, it's Deborah, you're right here. You've taught Sunday school here a long time. How often do we teach, like, remember, kids, you're going to be persecuted? Is that kind of a core message? No? Three weeks, he keeps on telling them, you're going to be persecuted. It turned out that way, Paul says. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you. Paul says, we're only there for this short amount of time, but we kept saying temptation is coming, trials are coming, you've got to be ready for this, this is going to happen, you've got to be ready. It's so interesting that I don't know if we're preparing ourselves for that. I think instead we try to uh, avoid trials, right? Or we try to prevent trials, we try to, to protect ourselves from them, but we're not really prepared for when they happen. How many of you would say in your lifetime you face some kind of challenge or trial? I think probably all of us have, some obstacle that we weren't prepared for. Wouldn't it have been easier to go through if you were prepared beforehand, right? Like if you're, any campers here, who's going to go camping this summer, anybody? Yes. Isn't it great when you bring the stuff you need instead of getting out there and then being like, oh, I should have brought the stuff, right? Oh, I should have brought a lighter for the fire. I should have brought a cooler. We should have packed water or a tent, right? It's better to be prepared and then go than to go and find out, oh no, I wasn't prepared. That's exactly what Paul is talking about here. Over those three weeks, he just kept on preparing them for it. I was reminded of something uh, that is profound but so obvious. What's the symbol for Christianity? Cross, right? We have this cross here. Why? Okay, fish also uses the symbol. Cross is the predominant one. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross, right? Jesus faced trials and persecution and crucifixion. Are we just reminding ourselves that happened? Or should we also be reminding ourselves that Jesus says, hold on, I need to take up my cross, that I need to follow him? Do I need to remind myself that Jesus said, Just like they persecuted me, the world will persecute you as well. Just as they hated me, the world will hate you as well. Because honestly, the cross isn't the greatest symbol to have at the front of the church. Like if we really wanted to attract people, I've come up with a couple better options. Check this out. (laughs) Hillside Christian Church, what if we had a great big palm tree here? Like what if it was actually a live palm tree and we just had, instead of carpeting, we just had nice white sand, right? And you'd come in and there'd be toys to play with and someone would walk around and have drinks, right, with umbrellas in them. Like, wouldn't that be more attractive? Or what about this? I think this would be appealing too. It was like Christian Church. You come in here and everyone, there's a lazy boy recliner for everyone and a remote for everyone, okay? Not connected to anything, but you come in, you sit down in this massage chair, you hold your remote, you just nap for an hour. We dim the lights. I mean, wouldn't that be more appealing? Up on the wall, a palm tree or a lazy boy? Way better. 
But that's not what Jesus went through, and that's not what we're called to follow him into. We're not called into, onto easy street. We're not called into a lazy boy lifestyle. We're called to follow Jesus, which means straight into opposition, straight into persecution. Why? To share the gospel of the one who came and lived and died and rose again for us. While we were his enemies, Jesus came, lived, and died and rose again for us. I'm concerned that as a church, as Christi as the Christian church in North America, we've been so worried about trials or persecution or suffering that we've just been letting those things happen to us and we've just been trying to hold the line, but it's been retreating further and further and further back. See if you recognize this. Oh, sorry, that's the cross, in case you didn't see the one up front. The symbol of Christianity, the cross. What's the next picture? What is this? How did this get formed? God and erosion? Look at how deep that is. Look at the chasm that has been formed there by erosion. Not by some drastic force. Water, right? Just a little bit has been peeled away, and a little bit has been peeled away, and a little bit has been peeled away until you have this devastating gully in the middle. That will happen to our faith if we're not tuned in to what is happening to us. As we're not aware of the, the forces of uh, the enemy who is opposed to us, that Satan is in fact still opposed, not just him, but his legion of demons. That, that's what will happen to us if we just keep buying into the thoughts, the philosophies, the beliefs of a secular society around us. It will erode our faith more and more until someone asks you, well, what do you believe in? And we'll just say, well, kind of the same as everyone else. You know, what do you believe? And I probably believe all the same things. We're called to this significant, powerful, fantastic faith, but only if we keep on holding on to it. We were at the, our family was at the theater uh, not that long ago, and we were watching this movie, and we were kind of on the fence. Would it be appropriate for everyone in our family from, from you know, a 13-year-old child to an 8-year-old child? And those movies can be kind of hard to find. And during the movie, it turned out it was not fully appropriate, okay? And so I'm covering Judah's eyes like this, right? And he's kind of looking like this. And Miranda's looking at me because she doesn't think I'm covering his eyes well enough. So then she comes and sits on the other side of him, and she's just got his face <laughs> plastered like this. And for more of the movie than we would have liked, and we were on the fence of like, should we leave? And, and so at the end of the movie, we're walking out, and I say, Judah, what'd you think of that movie? And he said, I didn't see much of it. <laughs> You know, and so that's protecting, right? We do have this role of trying to protect ourselves, protect our children from the things that are out there, but we also need to be preparing them because one day Judah's going to go to the movies without us, right? And he's not going to be like, oh, I better cover my eyes here. We need to be preparing ourselves, our children, the future generations for the things that are going on in the world so that they are ready and can say, well, of course society says that. Of course society believes that. But I believe this. Why? Because it's right here in the Word of God. Anyone recognize this guy? Anyone think of his famous quote, his most famous quote? Yeah, let's go to the next slide. Here I stand, I can do no other. God, help me. I can't move. Society can do whatever it wants. Other people can say whatever they want. Other denominations can do whatever they want. But I have to stand right here. I can't do anything else. Why? Because I believe this is what the Bible says. And I believe the Bible is true. And so God help me. God help me stand here so that I have the strength and courage to do it. And God help me if I'm wrong. Would he show me grace and compassion but I have no other choice except to stand here. If he was here with us today, he might say this instead. Stand firm, he'll sigh. Stand firm in what you've been taught. It's great. You know, sometimes people say, well, I was baptized as a kid. Great. That's so fantastic. Are you continuing to walk in that baptismal faith, that Christian faith? Are you standing firm with Jesus? Here's an encouragement for you. Just because we, we get so used to the attacks on our Christian faith, 
I'd encourage you to try this for one day and then text me or email me the results. Keep track, keep a count in your head of every time your faith is challenged. In every commercial you see, every billboard, every song lyric, every conversation, everything that's going on around you, keep track, keep a running tally. Oh, there it is again. There it is again. There, oh, this song is about living together before you're married. This show has this character who does these things. This movie is all about... The, keep track. I'd be curious to share those numbers with you. How many uh, confrontations, how many... Uh, attacks, how many pieces of opposition are we facing in a day, and then what are we doing to be ready for those? Uh, are we just absorbing that and saying, well, that's normal? Because if we do, that's the erosion, right, that's going to happen to our faith. Or are we saying, I'm seeing a lot of this message, and this is how I'll prepare myself for it. Maybe it means, maybe you're hearing a lot of messages about uh, made, about euthanasia. Maybe you need to start reading verses that, where God says that he's the author of life, that he's the one who's numbered our days, that he's the one who's gotten them on in a book, that he's the one who's going to call us home. Or, or maybe you're seeing a, a lot of messages about sexuality. Maybe you need to go back through the Bible and say, well, what did, uh, every day I just need to read these verses. What does God say about human sexuality? How are we preparing ourselves for the attacks since we know they're coming? You never see, when the football teams are both lined up, you never see some guy just standing there, like, eh, get nailed over and be like, well, I didn't know anyone was coming. Of course they were coming. You're on the field. You're on the battlefield. And so are we, Hillside. And we need to be prepared. I keep hearing, and maybe you've heard these things too. I probably hear them more because I'm a pastor, but I hear these things, that the church needs to change or else. Right? A, a common one has been, the church needs to start doing uh, same-sex weddings or else they're going to take our marriage license away. Right? Right? Or the church needs to change, or they're going to take away our tax-exempt status, right? You won't get a tax receipt anymore. And the fear is, well, if no one gets a tax receipt, no one's going to come to church, no one's going to give any money. Or, or the church needs to follow these rules and say all of these things, or else they're going to pull all the funding. Or the church needs to follow society's uh, rules and, and lines and progress, or else uh, if we don't do that, we're going to show up on their radar. Right? Like, what does that mean, even? Like, the church is, I mean, the government's fully aware that we exist, right? Hillside has not kept ourselves a very good secret since we have to be registered with the government and tell them how many members we have and all those other types of things. Instead of being worried that the government will find out what we believe, our hope should be that everyone knows what we believe and that we shouldn't be cowering, retreating, but we should be standing firm says this, But Timothy has just now come to us from you and brought good news about your faith and love. He's told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live. Since you are standing firm in the Lord, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Paul's been concerned about these people because he knows they're facing trials. He knows that they're facing temptations. And he's not sure, even though he's tried to prepare them, he's not sure if they've been ready for all the trials. I had a trial come up recently, and I didn't tell anybody, not even Cindy, about this, but I snuck away about a month ago and went to the happiest place on earth, Costco. <laughs> and I was not prepared for the trials I encountered, and I should have been, but there was trials when I got there. No parking, right? And so I'm driving through the lot, and I'm, dri and I'm way off, you know, when you're like kind of at, there's just like the street is out there and, and a million parking stalls here. Awful. I'm following little old ladies with their 3,000 rolls of toilet paper. I'm like stalking them through the lot. I cannot get a spot. And I'm crying out to God, why me, Lord? Why me? And I drove home with nothing. Are you ready for the trials you'll face? I was ready. I still have 100 rolls of toilet paper at home. 
So I'm in the safe. I'm in the clear. But are you ready for the temptations that come? Paul says, I wasn't sure if you were ready, but he finds out from Timothy as he brings back this report, it's okay. They were ready. And Paul says here, man, I keep thanking God night and day because of your faith. Uh, I love this line where he says that they had uh, pleasant memories of us, that the people in Thessalonica remember them fondly and well. Why? Because they've shared the gospel with them. And then he says, for now we really live, knowing that you're secure in the faith. When I go visit parents or when I go see grandparents, when they talk about their children, what they don't tell me about is how successful they are or their job or how much money they have in the bank. What they will report to me is their great joy that their children and grandchildren have kept the faith or their great sadness that they haven't. And for those families, for those people where their children have not kept the faith, I can tell you more than they pray for daily bread, they're praying for that child. God, please, Holy Spirit, please, Father in heaven, please bring them back so that my joy would be complete. I don't care about anything else except my children's, my grandchildren's salvation. Paul says, because I know you're safe and secure in the gospel. I thank him night and day. And he says, I want to see you again to supply what's lacking. That there's still more, right? That they can keep learning more. And it's his hope to go and see them so he can continue to establish them in that. Chapter 3 ends with this. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for, ev- for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. It's kind of this mix between a closing hope and a closing blessing and a closing prayer. As Paul just says, man, would God, if it's possible, would you clear the way for us to go and see our friends? And God, just like we, you've loved us and we love them, may their love for one another overflow and spill over more and more like that. And may he strengthen you so you'd live holy and blameless lives and he'd be faithful until Jesus returns. Hillside, that's my hope and my prayer for us. That our love for one another would just continue to build and build, that it would be a reflection of the way that God loves us. Us, that that's how we would love one another and that would spill over into all of our other relationships and interactions and that God would strengthen us so that we would be holy and blameless as we wait for our perfect Lord and Savior Jesus to return until that day may we stand firm amen let's pray together God we give you thanks today we give you thanks for your extraordinary faithfulness to us We give you thanks that you are a faithful God day after day after day without ceasing, that we can trust in your faithfulness and reliability, just like we trust in the sun to rise and even more so. Lord, we give you thanks that you have established us in the faith. Lord, I pray that we would be prepared for the attacks, prepared for the contrary voices and opinions that we'll hear and see every single day around us. Help us to not only try and protect ourselves, but also to prepare ourselves so we'll be ready. And not just ready with a a belief that we have or a thought that we have, but that we'd be even ready with scriptures to speak truth and remind ourselves of the truth of your word. Lord, we give you thanks for those people in our lives who know you. What a gift that is. What an encouragement that is. Lord, we pray for those that we love and care about who don't know you. Lord, we pray that they would be drawn into this faith so that our joy may be complete. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being part of a worshiping community, for being part of this church, and for people who are here for the very first time or people who have just been here for seemingly forever. Lord, I pray that we could be an encouragement to one another, that we could be like brothers and sisters who care about one another. Lord, for the obstacles and the challenges that people are facing, for the trials and the temptations facing them, Lord, would you 
Would you prepare us? Would you equip us? Would you strengthen us by your Spirit? Lord, for those who are struggling, uh, for those who are uh, going to surgery, or those who are facing a difficult diagnosis, or those who wrestle with their mental illness or well, for, for, for those who are struggling in whatever way that might look, we ask that you would provide for all their needs and that, that we would take a role in that, that we'd have a part in that. And Lord, for everything else in our hearts and minds, as we think about our youth going away on a, on a retreat, we ask that you'd be with them as we think about uh, our voters meeting where we talk about the life and ministries of this church. Would you guide us through that? Lord, as we think about your church around the world where persecution uh, is so much greater, would you strengthen them for that? We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand as we speak together the words of our Christian faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered and was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And he will come again, living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.